the first all-party Sri Lanka parliamentary group in the UK in 1975, after his election as Conservative MP for Northampton South. He has held various prominent positions in the House of Commons, and in 1994 he was appointed as a Privy Councillor, which is a title bestowed to people of high rank in politics by Her Majesty the Queen. And why I say that is because of his incredible and immeasurable support towards Sri Lanka. He persuaded Mrs. Thatcher not to cancel the Victoria Dam project in 1979, which up to date is the largest hydroelectric power station in the country. He worked with the late Honourable Garni Desarmai to get Sri Lanka test cricket status, which was achieved in 1984. To date, Lord Naseby is an avid cricket fan, but the question is, who does he support when England plays Sri Lanka? <laughs> Lord Naseby has shown an unswerving commitment to people of Sri Lanka, with their complex divisions of caste, religion, and race. And in 2005, he was awarded the Sri Lanka Ratna, the highest honor that can be given to a non-citizen. When the devastating tsunami struck in 2004, he raised funds and flew to Sri Lanka immediately to give all the help he could, accompanied by his wife, Anne, who is a medical practitioner and shares his love for this beautiful country. He takes every opportunity to defend Sri Lanka against untruths by speaking in debates, and he's currently engaged in trying to help Sri Lanka set up some of internal truth and reconciliation. A pessimist sees the difficulty in every opportunity, but an optimist sees the opportunity in every difficulty, and I believe Lord Naseby is the latter, a man who has blessed this nation with his love, compassion, and consistent support. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving the most honorable welcome to Lord Naseby, who will give us an introduction and insight to his new book, Sri Lanka, Paradise Lost, Paradise Regained. I can only say an enormous thank you looking around this room. I knew I had a few friends in Sri Lanka, but I didn't know it goes into the hundreds. Uh, and a huge thank you to each one of you for making the effort to come here this afternoon. And before any go any further, life is very strange. When I decided to write this book uh, some three years ago now, I never thought I'd ever write a book. And somehow or other, this passion began to grow. I managed to launch it in London in just before COVID struck in March two years ago. I had intended at that point to come in the late summer, early autumn, to here in Colombo to launch the book. But fate intervened in terms of COVID and I couldn't make the journey. But it was actually quite fortunate because it gave me the opportunity to reflect that I owed it to you to make sure the book was produced here in Sri Lanka. And uh, I therefore altered the order in London in terms of numbers of copies because I knew at some point I'd have the opportunity to come. And I want to say an enormous thank you to two companies who made this book possible here. They worked alongside the UK uh, uh, um, publishers, but my thanks go to two companies. BT Auctions and Aitken Spence. The paper is Sri Lankan paper. The ink is Sri Lankan. The whole quality of the production is Sri Lankan. So that's a great credit to industry and commerce to this wonderful country. And also, I have to say a thank you to a young lady, Dr. Senanaka, similar to many in the room. The effort, energy, commitment, enthusiasm that she put in 
to the day and all that led up to the day is unbelievable. So please stand up. Come along, young lady, stand up. As I said, I've never wanted, well, I've never thought about writing a book. But slowly, my deep interest uh, started a long time ago. Started because of one man. I didn't know I was even coming to Colombo. I worked for Wrecking Coleman. I thought I was on a two-year tour in Calcutta as a marketing manager. My boss said, you're doing a good job, Michael. I said, thank you, sir. One Monday morning, calls me in and said, uh, you can have a rise. I said, thank you, sir. That's the good news, he said. The bad news, he says, you, your wife, Anne, the dog, the baby, and the shotgun. You all are booked on a plane to Ratmalana Airport on Friday. So not much notice. And incidentally, what joy to see that Ratmalana Airport is now Ratmalana International Airport. And well done to whoever was responsible for making that happen. Somebody said to me since I got here, you must have been almost the last international flight that came into Ratmalana. But that's by the by. I came here because the boss man, or the chief executive, was on furlough, and the deputy uh, had done something uh, uh, allegedly wrong, and uh, he was put on a ship back to Hull in England. I came down to be the temporary CEO and the marketing manager. Uh, I hadn't had time to know much about Sri Lanka, but I soon saw what a wonderful country it was. And I assessed in my job for seven months was to see as much of Sri Lanka as I could do. I'm willing to bet that I see more of Sri Lanka than almost anybody in this room. I've been to every market that there is, uh, going around to the right or to the left or across the top or in the middle. I used to hire a bicycle rickshaw and get him to do it. I'd visit the wholesaler or the senior uh, shop that was there. I'd sit there and I'd enjoy a Coca-Cola or a Fanta. And, and this is entirely your fault, I am still addicted to casual nuts. <laughs> and in those seven months, uh, I launched Goya here. My wife and I decided that it'd be a good idea to launch it in our flat in Turret Road, just opposite of Victoria Gardens. Why did I do it in my home? Because I know enough about human nature that the press would be more interested in my home than anything else, uh, and they launched Goya. Uh, and I have to say a huge thank you to one of our sponsors today, EMAT, who now market Goya. So at least something uh, has, in perpetuity has happened there. And so, those seven months. I used to play good tennis. Unfortunately, I've got two artificial knees now. But um, I used to play with a young man who wanted to get into Parliament. A young man who you would all know of his name, Ananda de Tissita Alwis. He decided he was uh, in charge of JWT advertising. And uh, I'd done five years of records, so I decided it was time to go the other side and join an advertising agency. And so I sent my wife home with the baby, without the dog, uh, and without the shotgun. <laughs> and at uh, any rate, uh, he said, come on, let's play more tennis. Then. So we played more tennis, and his mother would provide a curry. And he would describe he was going to get into Parliament, and we'd have to go through the marketing plan of what he was doing. Uh, and that was really where the seed was sown. So it was here in this lovely climate that you have here, that the, the seed was sown for me to go into a political career. I never thought about it before, so it's entirely your fault, not mine. If I'd stayed in Calcutta, it wouldn't have happened. So, of course, I'm enormously grateful, really. I get home <coughs> to uh, London, and my dear wife has laid on a small dinner party to welcome me. Uh, her best friend, who was also a doctor, and her husband, ironically, was running the Conservative campaign for London. 
And he says to me, well, what are you doing, Michael, with your leave? I said, I'm looking after a little boy, uh, nothing much else. And he said, come and have it. Well, I, ha I hardly decided which political party to support, but I thought, yes, the Conservatives probably were the party I would support. So that was the start of it all. I got the bug, uh, and uh, we got a home in part of London called Islington. Uh, I was asked in 1966 to, to stand for Islington North, uh, part of that London, and then run the local election campaigns in 68. And then thankfully in 1974 I was appointed to the candidate of Northampton South. Northampton in the middle of England, still a very good cricket team, Northampton County Cricket Club, of which I have the privilege of being the president. I got elected on the third vote. First vote, I lost by 200 and something. Okay, have a recap. We had a recap. I win by five or six. Then somebody tips me off and says, break the bundles, undo the elastic band so you can have a look at the bundles of 25. And there should be four in the bit, another elected band. In the middle of some of the Labour ones were 25 of mine. <laughs> Not in one pile, but in several piles. Of course, by sheer chance. Don't really know, actually. At any rate, we win by five or six or seven. Can't remember the exact figure. So the Labour boys just have a recap. We, we end up winning by 179. So I get to Parliament. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, Labour Party have won, uh, but it has not got a very good majority. Harold Wilson decides six months later, another election. Swing to Labour. So I'm thinking, gosh, this is difficult. Uh, anyway, I marched, championed, questioned, did everything I thought I could do, every little trick of the trade I'd learned in the advertising industry. Um, got home by 141. That enabled me then, as soon as I got back after that election, to begin to think about Sri Lanka again. And in the late uh, spring, early summer, I joined the All-Party India Group of the Commonwealth. I asked them, can I please join the All-Party Sri Lanka Group? But we don't have one of those. I said, oh, what do I do to start it? They said, you have to find 10 members of Parliament who want to start it. Well, that wasn't very difficult. I mean, if you're keen on something, it's never difficult, is it? So I approached a Labour person first, somebody I had got to know, Betty Boothroy, someone who also sends her best wishes to everyone in this room. I uh, spoke to her, she sent me a message, uh, and she wishes to be remembered. So she and I started up the group, and it's still prosperous today, and that's a tribute to the interest there is at Westminster in your wonderful country. But you do set us a few challenges. I mean, come on now, this isn't, uh, hasn't been exactly the, uh, an easy ride, as they say. So, uh, as I report in the book, uh, we, a number of us, we make a number of visits, uh, begin to communicate to our own uh, foreign office and elsewhere uh, some of the successes of the country, some of the challenges he faced. So the early, uh, the early days are with J.R. Jawadna, uh, and things are going smoothly until the 13 soldiers are killed. And then they come down uh, and we get rioting in Colombo. Tragically, the curfew was not brought in early enough, uh, and we had terrible trouble, as you know. I came back uh, with my dear wife Anne, and uh, to Colombo soon after those troubles. I'm just going to quote a, a paragraph of what uh, my reflections were after the troubles were uh, quietened down. And I put in the conclusion to that visit, all in all, I think this was the most interesting tour I've ever made in Sri Lanka. Visits to the refugee camp had a salutary effect on one, it just seems so alien to the way of life in Sri Lanka that people just for a few days 
were, each, were at each other's throats. <coughs> you all face a daunting task in the months ahead, as the wound has gone very deep. All your friends in the UK are praying that the party talks will find a solution, although the omens do not seem too good. Well, that, that was uh, a difficult period. Things settled down, um, but it didn't really settle in terms of this being at each other's throats, really. Uh, and then, of course, you face the tragedy of the tsunami. Anne and I were sitting in uh, our sitting room on Boxing Day, and I said to Anne, listen, there's not much point by being chairman of the all-party Sri Lanka group and looking at the tragedy of the uh, Sri Lanka. She agreed, so as soon as uh, Christmas, the main bit of Christmas was over, I rang up to the, to the High Commission and said, we would like to come out and help. The same tragedy had affected the Maldives. And I also got hold of the chairman of the Disaster Emergency Committee and said, what are we doing about providing funds for Sri Lanka? He said, well, uh, can you come down? I said, yes, I can come down tomorrow. Uh, so I went down and saw him and we discussed it and the campaign was launched, which raised some 400 million for disaster relief. So that was good. We got on a plane a few days later. I couldn't get the plane organized for Sri Lanka, but we got one that went into the Maldives first. My memories of that was that, uh, as some of you will know, it's all little islands, and the sea had gone through a, a, a good two thirds of them and knocked out the electric generators. So uh, President Gaum made it clear to me that they didn't have enough electricians to sort this out. So I rang the High Commissioner in Colombo and said, has the Royal Navy arrived to help? Yes, they have, three ships, he said. I said, well, can I borrow the electricians off, off the ships, please? And he said, well, that's unusual, Michael. I said, yes, but this is, this is, this is unusual in any case. Uh, so five minutes later, he rang back and said, yes, permission is granted. <clears throat> Except one condition, he said. I said, well, what's that? There has to be some alcohol for the electricians who are working if they're going to work on the island. <laughs> so I said to President Guy, I know all your islands are dry, except for the tourist islands, but President, this is an emergency, you have to allow alcohol. And he said, you're quite right, we'll make a special exception, and we'll immediately put that through Parliament. So they came down. We flew back up to here, uh, and uh, I made contact uh, with, with the, your, your own people, and we went down to the south coast where much of the damage was done. And uh, Anne and I split up. Anne went and did some medical things to help particularly those who'd been uh, tragically lost uh, family. And that awful picture when I walked through where the train was lying and chapels on the ground, all sorts of bits and pieces. That's a, that's a memory that I'm never going to forget in my life. Um, and we did our very best for the best part of three weeks to make things happen. My job was to try and oil the wheels of the recovery. And that is something I never forget. Not least the fortitude with which the people who lived on the south coast lived. And just as a side issue, the elephants. Now my dear granddaughter is going up to the elephant orphanage because she wants to be a big animal vet. So that's great. But you all know that it was the elephants that banged the ground, creating, they felt the vibration of the tsunami before the waves hit. It was them banging the ground that ensured that snakes and animals all retired above the waterline. Quite remarkable, but that's an aside. So we move on in, as in time. Things like cricket, I have been mentioned. Gamini just and I, Gamini came to my home. A, a lovely friend, sadly taken away by the elder uh, uh, along with other very good friends. But before that happened, uh, he and I sat down in about 1982 and said, well, it's time we got Sri Lanka on the test match uh, status. 
And I said, okay, I will look after the UK, that is the NCC, which is the guardian of the laws of cricket. I will look after the government department that uh, uh, is responsible for sport. Uh, I will cover the rest of the cricket world in England and broadcasting authorities, etc. You'll have to look after India, Pakistan and uh, Australia. So we did that and what joy, what joy, to go to Lords to watch a man called Whitty Mooney, which many of you in this room will remember, uh, who still holds the record at Lord's Cricket Ground of the highest innings in a first innings of any test match. And that's a huge credit to him. So I enjoy immensely watching your cricket team. Uh, and I'm closely involved with cricket these days. But of course, there were less happy sides. I suppose the situation over the India coming in was not a happy occasion at all. Very difficult for any uh, country to accept another country having to come in and allegedly help them. Um, but you didn't have much option. One of the good things that came out of that was to make it quite clear that the Tamil language had to be an integral part of everyday life. And all the road signs demonstrate uh, and other things that that has happened now. Then we move on to the war period. Now I met uh, Colonel Gash uh, in the Hilton Hotel uh, in January uh, 2009. And uh, he said to me, I am amazed at what's happening, that people are coming across the lines at night. Uh, and I thought no more about it. Uh, I read about the awful things that were happening, <coughs> that allegedly were happening. And then later on I thought, well, I'll check on some of this. And I checked on it, and I uh, also had a freedom of information, uh, what we call a freedom of information request. Because he was there every day on the ground. He wasn't walking around the battlefield uh, just for pure pleasure. Uh, he was a very experienced general. And he reports regularly. And then I put in a freedom of information request, which is turned down uh, by the Foreign Office. Not once, not twice, not three times. I can't remember whether it was four or five, but it's in the book. <coughs> and at the end, I said to a lawyer friend of mine, there must be some means of appeal. And he said, yes, there is. You can appeal. This is what you do. So I appealed to the, the parties that you could appeal to. And I put a presentation to him saying, you know, hey, this, we have half a million Sri Lankans across all communities in the United Kingdom. They are taxpayers. They have a right to know what happened on the ground in that war. Uh, and he agreed. And as a result, he told the Foreign Office that, that that was basically the right point to make. And as a result, I got the re dispatches, 24, 26 pages. I was listened to the dates and found actually that was, for some unknown reason, a very few in April or May, and it all finished on May the 18th. So all of a sudden I say to the Foreign Office, well, what happened to the dispatches then? He didn't go on holiday, did he? Uh, and then they said, oh, no, this is on a different computer. I said, all right, well, can I have it off a different computer then, please? And, and they were delivered. But there was huge redactions in there. And I say today to you here publicly, that I'm not satisfied with those redactions. I've reflected on it for some time now. I'm going to try and get those redactions lifted one way or the other. Not least because it is off my Foreign Office, my Ministry of Defence, who have made the absurd statement that Colonel Gap has nobody to verify what he saw. When I thought the whole idea of sending a military attack experience in the field of battle was adequate. And that's a ridiculous excuse in my opinion. So I'm going to try very hard to get those redactions removed. I don't think Professor Pierce or anybody in the current government or previous government is going to worry about what's in those dispatches. There was no evidence at all in those dispatches of the five key claims that were made. Just to remind you very quickly, firstly it said 
that President Rajapaksa had a stated policy to, to kill Tamil civilians. No evidence at all, according to Colonel Gap. A claim of set, that the setting up of the five no-fire zones was a conscious policy to con congregate civilians so they could be killed. Now, we all know that it was the LTT who brought the civilians down as a human shield. And remember, this was a war, not just an uprising. So that doesn't stand up. Then we were told that Sri Lanka's government was out to starve the tigers and the civilians. Well, we all know, any of us that have worked in the East, that the government's civil service stay put on the ground. There is a go-down. They're there, civil servants. And there's go-down, uh, when I checked it, about it, immediately after the end of all, half full of food, kerosene, and all the other things. So that doesn't stir up. And then the fourth one was that there was ge genocide. Well, how come the best part of 300,000 uh, escaped into the, into the rescue centres like Manic Farm? That, that doesn't sound like genocide to me. And then, then the last one was that, uh, that uh, okay, they were rescued, but nevertheless, they were basically detention camps. Well, Anne and I went to, in quotes, this so-called detention camp at Manic Farm. We discovered the ICRC were there from day one. So whatever one thinks about any of these bodies, the International Red Cross is a genuine and the best of the voluntary bodies that we have, the Red Cross looking after through the wars all the people that are disadvantaged and fleeing from a war. So, so much for the uh, difficult side of life. And I finish though on a more positive note. The last page is about uh, my recollections and those recollections are basically saying uh, that Time, time is such an important healer, can be, and time because you as a country have young people of enormous talent. You, most of you, many of you will know the London Stock Exchange, the uh, software for that was produced by two young Sri Lankans. And there are others in many walks of life. Uh, particularly in the modern world, where young Sri Lankans are leading. And there are many more. And we've just done a deal, thankfully, that some of your nurses and young doctors can come into the NHS uh, on a sort of exchange basis and improve their abilities and then come back again to your health service. And I say thank you to our government, my government, that we've agreed to do that. And that shows that that is, has a reality to it. And I think, although everybody has a go at politicians, uh, and I've been a politician for a long time, you have to allow a little bit of time for any newly elected person uh, to settle in. Uh, and you couldn't try and settle in in a more difficult period than we are in now and have been with COVID for the last two years, and now Ukraine around our necks and uh, a deep worry to every single one of you in this room. I was bombed out of London in 1940. My mother and I and my little brother were sent down to uh, the borders with Wales, just on nearly 200 miles away, and lived in one room for about nine months. We were well looked after, but I can put myself in the tragic scenes that are happening uh, out there in Ukraine at the moment. But uh, we look, I look with positive uh, attitude to what Sri Lanka's future is. Uh, I quoted Paradise Lost, Paradise Regained, which is a poem, the Paradise Lost bit, uh, from Milton. Milton was the poet to our civil war, a civil war which ended almost at the Battle of Naseby, this is why I took the name, partly because there already a Michael Morris in the laws and four or five other Morrises, uh, and partly because all the wounded from that battle came into my constituency. 
So that's why the first half, uh, Paradise Lost, it was used in the title. And I'm going to end on a, a short quote from Milton, which I think is relevant to your country. Methinks I see in my mind a noble and puissant nation arousing herself like a strong man after sleep and shaking her invincible locks. Methinks I see her as an eagle, mewing her mighty youth and kindling her undazzled eyes at the full day, midday beam. I see that here. I personally give you a commitment that I will stick with it till we see that midday delight that we all look forward to seeing. And uh, I think we're very lucky, and you're lucky, that you've got somebody who's sitting there capable of taking you there alongside his other colleagues uh, in government. Thank you all for listening very much. Lord Naisley, for your words of wisdom, for your insight and for sharing with us your life's journey and experiences and your connection with this beautiful country of Sri Lanka. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor G.L. Pierce is a distinguished academic who previously served as the Vice Chancellor at the University of Colombo. He was also a visiting fellow at Christ College University of Cambridge, a smart visiting fellow in Commonwealth Studies at the University of Cambridge, and a Buttersworth visiting fellow in the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies in the University of London. Honourable Professor Pierce has authored a number of books in the fields of property law, criminal procedure, law of evidence and administrative law. He is the author of 12 books and over 75 papers published in international journals. Professor Pierce was a Rhodes Scholar at the University of Oxford, which is one of the most prestigious international scholarship programmes where he obtained his Doctor of Philosophy in 1971. He also holds a Doctor of Philosophy from the University of Colombo. Professor Pires received the title of Vidya Jyothi for exceptional scientific achievement involving original research. He will take us back in time and share his reflections on Lord Naisby as a friend of Sri Lanka for 50 years. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming Honourable Professor G. L. Pires. Members of the Mahasangha, my friend Lord Nesby, Your Excellencies, members of Parliament, Commander of the Sri Lanka Army, Secretary to the Ministry of Defence, ladies and gentlemen, Lord Nesby and I go back a long time. He told me that uh, his granddaughter, Kiara Allen, is visiting our country for the first time. She is greatly impressed with our culture, our rituals, one of which, as I explained to her, is the lighting of the oil lamp on all auspicious occasions in our culture. In our culture, we refer to a Kalyana Mitra. Kalyana Mitra, Lord Nesri, means a genuine friend, a friend for all seasons, good times and bad times, in power and out of power. But the steadfast loyalty, the goodwill, the commitment of a genuine friend, as opposed to a good weather friend, does not change with circumstances and situations. It is rock-like in its stability. I can think of no better example among our foreign friends who satisfies that definition than Lord Nesby. He has the further advantage of having been an astute and perceptive observer of the Sri Lankan scene over the decades. 
under successive governments, different challenges that we have to face, different situations, the manner in which we have reacted to those situations, our strengths and weaknesses, what we have done well, what we could conceivably have done better. Lord Nesby is in a unique position to make dispassionate judgments about all these things. There is, to my mind, a further advantage about his book. It is the distance in time between the events that he writes about and the publication of the book. It has occurred to me reading books of this kind that if you try to write about events soon after they have occurred, there is also, there is always the risk of uh, subjectivity. Uh, you tend to look at things through the prism of your own ideas and perceptions, sometimes your own prejudices, but after the effluxion of a significant period of time, I think it is easier to arrive at a more objective appraisal of the situations that one is writing about. Now I want to share with you some candid thoughts of mine about the subject matter of Lord Naysby's book, Paradise Lost and Paradise Began. There's no time to survey all of it, but I will comment succinctly on some of the highlights. Lord Naysby recounted just now, in his own words, the Herculean battle that he was called upon to wage in order to obtain from the British Foreign and Commonwealth Office the dispatchers that were sent to London by the military attaché of the British High Commission in Colombo during the closing phases of the war. Lord Naysby is a British peer of impeccable stature in the United Kingdom. He is the chair of an all-party group on Sri Lanka. It is in that capacity that he embarked upon this persevering struggle to obtain authentic copies of these researchers sent from the British High Commission to London during the relevant period. Now these dispatches by Anton Gash just now, Lord Maysby, described the circumstances in which he met Anton Gash. Just reflect on this for a moment. Here is a British official in no way connected with the Sri Lankan government. Not a friend of the Sri Lankan government, not an employee of the Sri Lankan government, no nexus of any kind whatsoever with the government of Sri Lanka. He was an employee of the British High Commission. And he had specialized knowledge of military matters. He was the military attaché. Now, bringing his own knowledge and expertise on the matters that he was writing about, he was reporting to his superiors in London. The heavily redacted, if you look at a page, you can read no more than one third of it. The rest is blocked out in dark type, totally illegible. You can't read what is there. Even what you can read was made available to Lord Naysby after this Herculean struggle. The British government simply refused to release 
negeri Sabah. Now there are two particular attributes of these documents. One is that they were contemporaneous. That is very important. These documents were prepared at the relevant time. What is the relevant time? The closing phases of the document. So that is the period that we are referring to. And then Gash's dispatches were prepared at that time. Not one year later, not five years later. While these events, or alleged events, were going on, Anton Gash compiled these reports for the purpose of making them available to his employers in London. Later, in the matters that he was reporting on. So you have a contemporaneous report by an expert in the field. Why then was it necessary to move heaven and earth to prevent these documents from seeing the light of day? Lord Naysby made repeated requests. They were turned down, one after the other. Then, as he just explained to us, he consulted legal opinion, and he had recourse to an independent tribunal. It is in consequence of the intervention of that independent tribunal that he was given the little that he got. And believe me, it wasn't much. Now, the interesting thing is this. We are told that all of this is, the, is in the interest of ethics and morality. This is for the discovery of the truth. From Olympian heights, we are surveying these events, and our professed goal and objective is to ascertain the truth, the truth of what happened. If that is indeed our aim and objective, what better, what more accurate or authentic evidence can there be than? the contemporaneous report prepared by an officer of a foreign mission for the express and specific purpose of bringing his expert observations to the notice of his minister and his minister's staff in London. But that is suppressed. It is suppressed with an iron will Nothing would shake the British government to prevail upon them to make these documents available to a peer of the realm, a member, a long-standing member of the House of Lords. Is there then any possible connection between that behavior and this quest for truth? What we are doing all the time. We are doing this in your interest. We want to look after you. This is enlightened benevolence. Doesn't that ring very hollow? What is the degree of credibility that one can attach to that assertion? When everything possible is done, not to ascertain the truth, but to suppress the truth. That is the fundamental question that I would like to address to you. By all means, let us ascertain the truth. What is the truth? The Ministry of Foreign Affairs of this country is in possession of an extensive dossier consisting of legal opinions by some of the world's best legal minds, specialists in international humanitarian law and international human rights law. The late Sir Desmond De Silva, Queen's Council, who is unfortunately no longer with us, but he did an exceedingly valuable amount of work which she has left behind and which is now in our possession. 
There are also extensive legal opinions by Sir Rodney Dixon, QC, Sir Jeffrey Nice, QC, and other legal counsel of impeccable, absolutely unimpeachable stature with an acknowledged international reputation. So Desmond de Silva was not only a great jurist, he was also a soldier. He began his life as a soldier in the field. His work, therefore, represents a unique combination of military expertise and legal acumen. John Holmes has provided a military input which has enriched and supplemented the submissions of learned counsel. And I assure you the armed forces, I assure the armed forces of Sri Lanka that there is not one shred of evidence that would make them in any degree vulnerable in any proceedings before an international tribunal. There are well known international, internationally accepted principles of law relating to genocide, war crimes, principles of identification, principles of proportionality. There is not the slightest risk of vulnerability on the part of Sri Lanka's armed forces who have in no manner whatsoever contravened any provision of international law. I'll come to that in a moment. The interesting thing is that the whole focus is now shifting from genocide, war crimes, and the closing phase of the war to what are admittedly and demonstrably internal affairs of this country, which are far beyond the score of the Human Rights Council or any other organ of the United Nations system. But before I come to that, I want to touch on another point. That's on the subject of truth. Because this whole thing is put on, the, on a very high moral pedestal. A very high moral pedestal. Now, just for a moment, consider this situation. A travel advisor which tells the British public, do not contemplate a holiday to Sri Lanka because terrorist violence is likely. I'm quoting the exact sentence from the travel advisor. Terrorist violence is likely. So says the British government. Terrorist violence is likely in this country. Now, is this true? I'm still on the subject of truth. Is this true? There are many problems in this country. And tourists are well aware of those problems. Power cuts, shortage of diesel, shortage of gas, all these are facts of life. Tourists are aware of those. And a travel advisory can certainly draw attention to these inconveniences which may be suffered by tourists who are planning a visit to this country. But I ask you, now there are people from different political persuasions, it is a very varied group in this hall. I'm asking you in all sincerity, in all candor, is there one person in this hall who believes that terrorist violence in this country is likely? Does anybody believe? that bombs are likely to go off anywhere on the island. Does anybody for one moment imagine that this is likely or very likely? We protested vehemently. We are talking about the truth. We are lecturing to us about truth. Is this true? The answer is, ah, but we have been saying this for two years. And then we said that terrorist violence is very likely. Now we have downgraded that from very likely to likely. Is that at all a convincing or acceptable answer? If it is not true, if nobody in this world believes for one moment that terrorist violence is likely in this country, then why state an untruth? 
we have all familiar with conditions in this country. We know what problems exist, what problems are real, and what problems are imaginary. But if you were a British family contemplating a holiday with your loved ones, with your friends, would you for a moment consider a holiday in a country where your government says, the government of that country says, that terrorist violence is right? There are other distinctions. Mm -hmm. Marie Fernando is here, she is doing everything we possibly can to promote tourism in this country in a very imaginative way. But you know, often there is problems like this. If people are told that bombs are likely to go off in this country, a palpable alarm truth. Is that fair? I'm not asking for generosity. I'm not asking for kindness. As a country's foreign minister, I'm asking for fair play for this country. I'm asking for justice. I'm asking for an objective and a dispassionate view of situation. And it is very important, my lord, that the public of this country must believe that whatever is done by these other people is genuinely for the well-being of this country and not to promote the fortunes of politics and politicians in other countries. My country cannot be used as a political football to serve Bohm's interests. By all means, give us advice. There is no arrogance on our part. We are not self-opinionated. We do not believe in an isolationist policy. We do not want to cut ourselves off from the world. We want to engage with the world. Engage with the world. But in a spirit of partnership, on the basis of equality, in a manner that is at all times compatible with the dignity and self-respect of Sri Lanka. This is what we insist on. Then very briefly, just look at the contemporary. In Geneva, on behalf of this country, I made five short points. I won't take more than five minutes to tell you what those points are. First one is, look at the state of the contemporary world. We are on the cusp of a very dangerous implosion in the heart of Europe. That is what we see around us. In that state of things, in the contemporary world, is there any rational justification for the degree of focus, attention, energy, money that is being spent on Sri Lanka? Is there any correlation, is there any proportion between the situation and the response? Is it by any stretch of the imagination proportionate? If it is not proportionate, then what is the reason for that disproportion? Secondly, we have now left the war far behind us because it has no traction. It has no traction. Now, the focus is on something completely different. The internal affairs of this country, constitutional reform, the balance of authority between the central government and provincial councils, the propriety or impropriety of appointments in the army, the police force, and the administration of this country. Was it ever intended by the General Assembly of the United Nations when they established the Human Rights Council? Did it cross their mind in the remotest way that the Human Rights Council which they were setting up would have authority to decide who should occupy high positions in the army, the defense ministry or elsewhere? Is that the job of the Human Rights Council? The Human Rights Council is not a law unto itself, it is a tribunal of limited jurisdiction. Its authority derives from the Eternal Assembly and at all times. It must operate within the confines of the authority bestowed upon it by the General Assembly in New York. Also, if you, if, you, if you were to carry out this kind of inquisition about my country, I ask the question directly, are you prepared to embark upon 
The similar Inquisition invested the whole 192 states in the United Nations system. It would be a very interesting exercise if that were embarked upon. What would be unearthed would be quite fascinating. Are they prepared to do it? Not only on earth. They can't be. They wouldn't dare. In that case, is there stark discrimination? Is there equality of treatment? The very pillars of the United Nations system, the principle of sovereign equality, equality of treatment. In the words that they themselves use, objectivity, non-selectivity, non-selectivity is a mantra. What has happened to that mantra? Sri Lanka is being singled out by the application of standards and criteria which are not being applied to any other country on the planet. Is that because we are small? We don't have large armies? We are not an affluent nation? Is that the reason? When I ask you to look at some of the salaries that are being paid to the people who are being appointed to gather and evaluate evidence against this country, Enough money for about four or five generations. Extremely lucrative business is human rights business. Once you are in it, you can live a life of luxury. So there are Western interests here. Just look at the emoluments of the people who have been elected, how much they are being paid every month. Now all this expenditure is happening in a situation where one half of humankind is struggling for access to life-saving vaccines. Is this a rational? I say, is it a sane? Is it a sane utilization of scarce resources available to humankind at this challenging time? Okay, let's say you want to spend the money. What is the result of it? Are you doing any good to anybody? Is there any benefit accruing from the from this colossal expenditure? Not in the least. Far from doing good, it is doing incalculable harm. It is doing incalculable harm by splitting the international community right down the middle. Many countries have told me, we are sick and tired of this. Every six months we are hauled up here. We are forced to vote no, I or A, or to sit in the middle. They are exhausted. It's not doing any good. And what is more, perhaps more relevant, it is creating polarization in Sri Lanka. Dramatic polarization in Sri Lanka. So these are the reasons why this whole exercise, which Lord Nesby has very eloquently commented upon, is not what it seems to be. There is a fundamental difference between the appearance and the reality. And that is the central message of Lord Nesby. That is what leaps out of the page. I commend Lord Nesby for the courage that he has shown in taking on the system, the indefatigable energy that he has displayed in fighting the establishment, going again and again to obtain the information that he has sought. Although he has succeeded only partially, I salute him for that endeavor. I recognize him as a genuine friend of Sri Lanka. I pay tribute to Lord Michael Nesby for the consistency with which he has pursued his aims and objectives over decades. Thank you very much, Lord Nesby, on behalf of Sri Lanka. Curious for your passionate speech and for your reflections on Lord Nesby's 50 year journey with this beautiful country. Well, ladies and gentlemen, what a profound book launch it has been. I heard a wise man once say, A journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step, and today we have witnessed a 50 year journey that all began with a single step by Lord Nesby, which we celebrate today. Today's book launch would not have been possible without our esteemed sponsors and organizing committee. And on behalf of Dr. Pramila Senayake, I want to thank the following 
who have made today possible the sponsors SLT Mobitel, the national telecommunications service provider in Sri Lanka, Haymast Holdings, a leading public quoted company in Sri Lanka, engaged in a diverse set of business activities, BT Options, who are the publishers of Lord Nesby's book, Sri Lanka, Paradise Lost, Paradise Regained, Aiken Spence PLC, a blue chip conglomerate with an indisputable repute as one of Sri Lanka's pioneering corporates, Sri Lanka Tourist Board, namely Mrs. Kamali Fernando, Mr. Masita, and Dhammika for all their efforts. BMICH, Mr. Disamayaka, Devanti and their team, Mount Lavinia Hotel and Dilma Tea for the refreshments, Lastana Flora, led by its chairman, Dr. Lasanta Malavige, is the leading florist in SL today. The Family Planning Association, led by Ms. Bushara Argus, for providing the artwork and other logistical support. Kay Berenja and her team from Life Story and Sugandhi and Minoshi for providing logistical support. And Mr. Kirti Ariratna for all the local coordination and the generous support. Once again, thank you to all our distinguished guests for gracing this occasion. Uh, I would like to now invite Lord Naseby to take his seat at the signing desk. And for all those who have already purchased the book, Prior to the event, you can collect it from the collection point. And for those who would like to purchase a book now and get it signed, you can do so by visiting the desk right in front of me. And once again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. And please do enjoy the refreshments that will be served to your table with Lord Nathan's name and the cover of the book. Thank you once again for being here today.